Hello and welcome to the Questioning Behaviour podcast. My name is Sarah Bowen and as always I'm here with my good friend and colleague Miala van den Acker. Mm-hmm. Hi, hi. You're the dummy that don't believe in science. All your projects always be denying. And today on this episode, we are going to be talking to someone who has uh, a lot of experience, a lot of interesting experience setting up their own behavioral business. Um, And that's really the theme of this episode, like setting up your own business as a behavioral scientist. Um, But yeah, today we're going to be talking to Torben Emmeling. Mm -hmm. Uh, who is uh, a pioneer who started Effective Advisory uh, based in Zurich, Switzerland, and also more recently has uh, been one of the pioneers of the new GABS program, which is, Mela, help me out with the acronym here. Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists. Mm, Beautiful, Mm -hmm. beautiful. Yeah, we should probably mention in this episode, uh, just for clarification and uh, good manners, Torben is not the first person we're talking to who specifically has started their own company in behavioral science or has a company in behavioral science. But I think from the perspective of the people that we've already talked to, most of them also were quite heavily research based. Torben, I would argue, is predominantly known for having started Effective Advisory. So this is no way of snubbing any of the previous interviewees who also have their own companies. Uh, Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We have great respect for everyone we've interviewed so far. This is just, we we know Torben started Effective Advisory quite recently. It's a fully behavioral science focused consultancy, and it's also not based in either the UK or the Netherlands. So we were quite curious as to how that went. Mm. So that yeah. is exactly what this episode is about. We're going to dive into how we set up Effective Advisory, how we rolled into behavioral science, identified the niche in the market, and of course, we're going to also talk about the GABs. Because um, it's quite interesting to see that uh, the practitioners are uniting to... Uh, yeah, to, to do good scientific research with a mm. with an eye towards what's happening in academia. So yeah, let's dive into that. So I said in the introduction, today we are talking to Torben. So Torben, please tell the crowd, who are you and what do you do? Yes, I'm Torben. I'm a, an entrepreneur and an applied behavioral scientist who's deeply interested in human behavior, I'd say, and the strategies and public policies leveraging a better understanding of human judgment and decision making to change human behavior. So as such, I'm the founder and managing partner of Effective Advisory. It's a specialized behavioral science consultancy working with private and public organizations. I'm also a co-founder and board member of the recently founded Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists. And I'm a lecturer and keynote speaker in behavioral science and applied consumer psychology. Hmm. Excellent. We should probably mention Torben is young. <laughs> Torben is <Yeah>. that young. <laughs> is there anything you don't do, I mm. guess? Age. Uh, yeah, age. A, a lot of things I don't do, actually. Um, but I think this field is just so interesting that I happen to do a lot of things at the same time. And I also happen to enjoy a lot of things at the same time. So it's something. And yeah, the intersection of science and practice which got me into this and which I very much enjoy. Okay, so taking this step by step, out of all the aforementioned, what came first and why? Um, First came the interest, I'd say, in how humans decide and behave and how, I'd say, context impacts human behavior and decisions. I was uh, out of university uh, with a bachelor's degree in economics and finance did a lot of econometric modeling financial modeling and i was Um, while while i enjoyed that i wasn't really convinced that the rigorous and sometimes simplistic assumptions we take uh, are able to model what actually happens in society Mm -hmm. and so i was looking for new ways and insights to sort of combine that and i was then back in 2011 and 12, first time in touch with the popular literature and behavioral science, all the major books we all know and we all enjoyed, um, at least some of them, and, uh, <laughs> and and some of us maybe even. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was, yeah, I was feeling that this field 
um, called behavioral science is opening up a new understanding and a better understanding um, about this interest I'm having. And so I began reading and studying everything I could on that and graduated later with a master's in behavioral science. Um, and from that point on, started developing an interest in combining my desire to do an entrepreneurial job and take an entrepreneurial opportunity in the field of behavioral science. So it was definitely the interest and then has led to the foundation of the firm. And then with that, the works in several areas and projects and publications, and then sort of step-by-step step into, hey, you're doing interesting things. Can you talk about it? Um, can you um, help us create a course? Can you sort of, are you interested in founding or are you sort of, it was driven a lot by ourselves as well. Are you, are you finding other opportunities to sort of spread the word about the impact of behavioral science on, mm -hmm. on strategy and public policy and so step by step by step we we ended up doing all these exciting things and there's more to come so i'm, I'm very happy about this i can imagine exciting and so you were <laughs> a dis disillusioned economist is that and then ah uh, wow that's a big word i i wouldn't say i was disillusioned i was just feeling and i have to say and i mean we've come a long way in economics and i think especially the last 10 years have been really uh seeing a behavioral revolution a behavioral take on a lot of things mm -hmm. and well, i think we all agree that the rigorous assumptions or simplistic assumptions of neumann and morgenstern and others that are mm -hmm. allowing us to model things in an easy way but are not necessarily picturing the real um behavior are nice to have but sort of not really capturing what's what's happening so there's a lot to be done. And I've, I felt that the field is going personally in a very, very interesting direction. And I was, I'm happy to be observing and seeing this and, and maybe even in some really small, small pieces contributing to it. Cool. Yeah. I think in a big way, I think in a big way you're, you're contributing. I mean, so tell us more about, um, the work you do and with your consultancy effective advisory. What's, what's that like day to day? Um, it's that's a good question uh, you sometimes <laughs> you sometimes wonder oh yeah we're doing all this and you rarely sit back and sort of say okay what are the different puzzle pieces that come together but if i'm doing this now together with you i'd say it's it's a lot of um actually a lot of academically informed work we do in the sense that we try to take a very rigorous research-based approach to our projects Mm -hmm. So we have this, this process, which we call drive, and which starts with a clear definition and research phase of what the, the target that we want to achieve, the target behavior we would like to realize in a specific group, and a research of the current behavior and context. So it's this idea of we want to see how we can realize X, and we're looking at what is happening in context and behavior why at the moment and the gap between the two and then based on that we are looking into ways to change that in a robust and ideally scientifically informed and, and evidence-led uh, way and that again is a combination of looking what what has worked in academia so looking into lab studies and and, and publications that have shown effects um, in research and we're also looking into practices and applied work and we're trying to always combine two things so using insights from academia and then translating them into practice so i think i've been asked so what is it you're doing and where you sit in the spectrum between academia and practice i would say i'm sort of a connector and translator between the two worlds mm -hmm. and um we're doing a bit of research ourselves and we do published from time to time more in like really practitioner oriented formats mm -hmm. um but we do almost every day read minimum one or two papers um and we try to really apply and stay really close to what is done in academia and how we can then translate this into practice yeah all right well that's pretty straightforward now sarah is already looking towards the day-to-day -day because i know sarah is is gonna go into this field so as sarah's gonna be a practitioner soon i i wanna <laughs> well i know she is gonna be <laughs> um, well dependent on 
employment status and global pandemic. But yes, yeah, maybe. Well, I remain, <laughs> I remain very optimistic and have 100% faith in Sarah's abilities. Um and sell us you're so welcome <laughs> now but my question is more i, I can picture the day-to-day -day because uh ironically enough you're not the first practitioner we're, we're talking to um what i find really really fascinating is that you're actually i think you might be the first or one of the first entrepreneurs that we've spoken about so how do you actually go about setting up your own company in behavioral science because within academia behavioral science is quite recognized i think it's predominantly an academic field although i don't mean to insult the practitioning side by it but i feel like there's still a lot of issues within behavioral science in in practice or when you have to apply it to business where a lot of companies just don't recognize the proper value of behavioral science yet um, so to me, that that seems like a, a very, very different battle, maybe an even an even heavier battle. So I'm, I'm quite interested in that, how that came about and what the struggle was there. And of course, I'm also interested in the success story, obviously. But first, the struggle. <laughs> first, the struggle. OK, that, that's a big question. Let's let's try to unpack that step by step. I think in general, if we look at consulting work or in general, public policy and strategy work, mm -hmm. it always comes down to all sort of whenever we work with human beings, it comes down to changing a behavior. Mm -hmm. Every strategy is sort of a change from somebody is doing A to doing B in the future. And so whenever we look at how we reach people best in order to, to make change happen, we should think about the motivators, the blockers, barriers, enablers that we know about and that are there and that are existent to change behaviors. And the, this whole raft of research from the past 40 years in behavioral science has offered a tremendous resource uh, we should use um, to inform our strategies and public policy. So that was, in my opinion, that's sort of a natural idea. Why don't we look at what science has already found out and why don't we then apply what's been found out in practice to change mm -hmm. people's behavior in a good and ethical, technically correct way. So. I felt there is an immediate fit and I felt that many of the existing processes um, in consultancy and in generally in strategic and public policy work are sort of outdated. A lot of it, a lot is about best practice and just copying other people's strategies and, and policies without necessarily going deeper into the challenge that we're trying to solve without necessarily creating a real competitive advantage, which is unique to an organization or unique to an, a very effective policy because it's tailored around the specific need and context we're in. Um, so to me, that is logical. And it is logical that we should apply an understanding of how people take decisions, make judgments and behave to actually realize change in society and organizations. The way we, we got into this was I felt there is a huge need for this, as I said, as I just described. Mm -hmm. I also said there is there is a market for this. I'm sure p we can convince people with good solutions. We just have to tell them that these solutions might be better than the existing copycat best practice solutions. Mm -hmm. And so there were two challenges. On the one hand is packaging and translating academic insights into practice making it actionable for people uh, to execute. Um, secondly, using maybe even a corporate lingo or a policy lingo, which is sometimes different from an academic uh, way to communicate insights and practices. And then third, also just really connecting the two vice versa, meaning let's have a start a conversation that is not only from academia to practice, but also from practice back to academia and just connecting the, the, the elements a lot better. So that was yeah. the, the fundamental underpinning of why, why and how we started getting into this. Bit. And then the, the, the entrepreneurial journey or <laughs> the success story, um, Mali was asking, which is still in the making. Um, we're still working on it, making it, a, um, an even better success story is the the idea of saying what we wanted to do wasn't there so at least not in the german speaking part of europe and sure. we're looking to create a team that was 
really, really focused on this idea of applying rigorous behavioral insights and practice. And we wanted to have a team that was, yeah, professionally qualified and still experienced in business. So, or public policy. So it just didn't exist. And so we say, when it's not there, let's, let's create it. Mm -hmm. And we also said, let's, let's from the very beginning, start with a very clear mission to say, we're the group or one of the few groups around the world that is dedicating their time and resources to creating actionable insights on the basis of rigorous science. And so that has come together. And then I was always really intrigued by the idea to, to sort of found the firm, create a brand, create a message, be sort of, yeah, creating an entity, a team, a, a group of, of exciting minds uh, that, that really work for the benefit of, of a client and being at a public or a private organization. Yeah. That still has told me absolutely nothing about the practicalities <laughs> of setting up a firm, but I guess I'll take the answer because I have a feeling you're just not going to tell me. No, well, no. Merle just wants, wants, wants to set up her own firm. Yeah, She's like, just I, tell I me how like, to do it. Give yeah. me the recipe. What's the 10-step <laughs> plan? Like, ready, steady, cook. Like, hello. <laughs> uh... <laughs> I, I will never forget that conversation with Kunzmas. Like, ready, steady, cook for behavioral science. It's exactly what I want. It's what I need. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is that there's a lot of a behavioral science you can apply to starting a behavioral science firm. <laughs> and Excellent. there's a lot of things you sort of, you realize in hindsight that, oh, I should have known that better. So as with any yeah. entrepreneurial endeavor, there are moments where you feel like, oh, mm -hmm. this I could have known. <laughs> but overall, in some, uh, I guess for us, it's been the combination of really conviction that this is, this is, the market is ready and there is there is um a real demand and desire out there for the services we offer so um, that was the number one thing number two i think supply and demand economics supply 101. and demand yeah. basic economics <laughs> mm -hmm. and then creating that as a as a really cohesive and structured process in terms of we have a we created a framework to put in place we we everything we do is around that principle we're always asking challenging ourselves if what we're doing is science based if it's mm -hmm. rigorous in its approach and in delivery if it's if it's um if it makes sense both from a business and a public policy perspective and mm -hmm. that that thinking and these conversations is probably what created the firm and what is still helping the firm all right and then there's a lot of things like admin, hiring, um, yep. <laughs> long HR discussions, sales. <laughs> HR, uh, sales. You're everything. Like, this is it. As an entrepreneur, independent of the field and the work you do, it's you're always everything and nothing at the same time. So well, that's <laughs> very in <laughs> inspirational, <laughs> aspirational. Um, so you, you've already mentioned a couple of times that, that your firm, uh, well, I keep calling it your firm, but effective advisory. Uh, and so you and your team are very grounded in, in applying actual science and that you're trying to, yeah, the research that you do, the projects that you do, that you try to apply science and you try to apply it correctly and rigorously. Now, my question is, how well trained is your team? Like, do you just all have like a bunch of experimental psychologists hanging about or how does this work? <laughs> This is something I'm actually really proud of. So the whole team consists of people with a qualification in behavioral science, all at a master's or PhD level. So uh -huh. we, we have, and this is sort of the vision and the next step for the firm. We're currently three full-time people in Switzerland, plus four experts around the world. And oh, nice. the, the idea is now to grow this team to a core team of five people here in Switzerland mm -hmm. and to be all of them have a behavioral science related qualification. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, we work with, yeah, as I said, in, international experts or colleagues, senior advisors that all, again, bring behavioral science qualification and minimum 10 years in a specific industry for example oh don't tell me you're one of those don't tell me you're one of those employers who's like you know behavioral science a super young field but you need 15 years of experience in it to get hired no 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 we Good. do when, when we hire full-time roles we really look into what people have done 
in in their studies and in their academic qualifications. So not only what degree they bring, but also what, for example, what the thesis was about, what they're interested in, what projects they've been involved in, because that tells us how people want to apply behavioral science in practice. Sure. Um, it's really not the checkbox exercise of show me your nice degree with your best grades and your distinction and you sort of going to be hired because you've been sure. to X, Y, Z. Sure. No, it's not. I'm sorry. It's really about getting <laughs> an understanding why people are doing this and why they're driven to want to be in this field. Mm. For the for the international experts, these things usually aren't like the traditional hires. It's mostly people that that I've met or that I know of and or I have been in touch with for longer, where we we've been on joint projects and where we the collaboration has worked super well and we wanted to to bring them on board and work with them longer. And where I just feel we're bringing the expertise that is needed for a project or that really gets a project to the next level to the table. I've never, and it's actually an anecdote we had in a meeting with a, with a client two years ago. I never try, I never try to bring expertise on a project that isn't needed. You know, it's, it's always, sure. we are a special, a specialized consultancy. And so our, value is in bringing this specialized expertise into projects and so what we bring to the table is this specialized expertise of course not there's nothing more than that so that's the setup right now and it's sort of why i think we're i think one of the very few teams that have such an yeah rigorous and strict approach to who we have on board and how we would like to develop ourselves further all right I just think what we see though is is there is <laughs> is there is quite a demand in the in the field of the design the whole idea of behavioral science and design not only like digital design but also real artifact contextual design mm -hmm. is is something I'm I'm really in, intrigued by and I I'd like to develop us further and the other pieces we're seeing a lot in in marketing and communication at the moment and this is something I'm, I'm i'm reviewing really critically because there's a lot of marketing and comms and, and yeah various various experts in the market and various studies done that aren't necessarily sound behavioral science and so this this is a, a difficult niche to maneuver and i'm mm. trying to see how we could sort of get that well, so, I can yeah. I can name you two international experts in behavioral design if you're looking for them, but like they're really well known. So I'm pretty sure you know them yourselves. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm just saying as um, I do know them and I, I do um, value them a lot. I think they're um, I expect we speak about the same two. Um, oh yeah, mm -hmm. awesome people. Mm -hmm. Very but likely. I would need to convince them to get on our team. <laughs> so I'm rather looking to, if you're asking me how to, ex, how to expand our team and what sort of, what am I looking at? It's the behavioral science plus the design, right. the behavioral yeah. science plus the mark and comms, but always with this really important behavioral science. And Do you think you will, you will ever sort of expand enough to, or in terms of expanding the people you want on your team to include people like who are trained as like engineers or as designers or architects because you know from my conversations with people who are within these fields often they are applying behavioral science or thinking about design uh in a way that's you know very very similar to how behavioral scientists would approach a problem but coming at it just from you know with a different set of tools and a you know different language is that something that you th you think uh we should be aiming for like bringing in more fields um I do think so, yes. Problem? I do think so. Um, as long as they're all sort of uh, applying the same rigorous approach to human-centered um, research. And I'd say, yes, of course. I think the whole field, what it, what makes behavioral science so interesting is this this intersection of various sciences and fields and various approaches and various, sometimes even various languages to to address the same problem and um i do absolutely believe in diversity and then the multidisciplinary uh, approach to problem solving and i i'd say definitely we we'd need more of that and for example i personally like architecture a lot and i admire um designers of furniture and uh, i think i even i've even covered that in in the interview 
I gave to Mele's blog at the time, yep. a written interview, that there is, I, I really do think this, these disciplines in particular have studied how humans behave and interact with, with physical objects in such a detail that there's a lot to learn for us in our discipline. Yeah, absolutely. I've often fallen down the rabbit hole on YouTube of watching like van builds, like van life. And just how you have this tiny space and trying to optimally design like the most comfortable living area and people just ha with the same constraints coming up with multiple solutions are so fascinating. And I'm looking at being like, I am, that is such a barrier to have to make my bed out of like five different pieces of cut of like wood a night. I would just sleep on the sofa. I'm like, that's probably. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> that aside. But uh, um, no, I think it's really side interesting. note. I'm I'm currently reading the designer of really things by Don Norman. So just just uh, this is my bedside book at the moment, reiterating the point of my interest in sort of the intersection of behavioral science and physical design. Mm. No, right. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I I was gonna uh, ask a question about the fact that you're you're I from my perspective, I think you're sat at a very interesting intersection or you know you have a very uh, uh very much a foot in both worlds and i can sort of understand and see quite clearly how you can um you know keep pulling information from academia and you know keep up with academic knowledge you know looking at published papers um uh, and you know try trying to find the insights produced from academia but maybe this is just my Naivety, but how do you do the same within the applied world? Are there resources or depositories where you can look uh, and see what has been done by applied scientists and get enough information about sort of the implementation and the results and the intervention and the context in order to apply that to your own work? How does how does that work? Um, that's you're right. This is much more difficult for various reasons. It's Private organizations aren't usually used to sharing data, even in an anonymized way. And they're sometimes not even interested in doing that because it might give others, um, yeah, an advantage or sort of an, an easier route into doing the same thing, which I think is, is, especially when it comes to, for example, topics where we all benefit from being at ethics, compliance, uh, links to societies, um, socially desirable behavior in organizations, um, which I think is a, is a missed opportunity. So we are actively motivating our partners to share and publish data. And we are aware that sometimes these data sets and these results of our studies don't make the criteria for, <laughs> for a peer reviewed journal with a high impact factor, of course not, but still, um, if done properly, these practitioner insights have a lot to uh, to contribute to the way we think about organizational behavior and the ways to change organizational behavior for the better. So we are doing this ourselves. Um, we are trying to mitigate this challenge or sort of addressing this challenge by creating good networks within uh, practice. So speaking to other consultancies, speaking to other practitioners, speaking to people who sit in similar roles within bigger organizations to really um, yeah, encourage such an exchange. And even if it's just on an aggregate of data. And then lastly, we we're trying to really be, and this is when it comes down to, to discussion on gaps as well. We're really trying to be supporting this development and sort of the connection between academia and practice and practice with each other um, to, to share data and give a platform that, that, allows the the exchange of how do you do this when when and how and 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 why did you do this this way and these simple questions currently aren't addressed properly and so we're we're really active in, in sort of connecting some dots that haven't been connected before is that the motivation behind gaps to actually be a, a proper network for sharing data and figuring out what one practitioner is doing or a, a practitioning based company uh, and then to extend that or is was it because I initially understood that that gaps was I mean that's my understanding that gaps was a way of ensuring that the behavioral science being practiced was actually of a rigorous standard 
It's it's one of the reasons, several, um, including also the yeah the safeguarding of a certain standard sure. um, of ethical and technical conduct. Um, but definitely, 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 it includes also the the exchange of practitioners and the the creation of a platform where people can safely um, and openly exchange what they are doing in practice and how others might benefit um from that know-how and how they again would benefit from other people's know-how so the, the regular idea of like speaking uh about the topic and getting better um by learning from others so yes. what motivated you to set this up because i mean you you were one of the people who helped set this up like i'm, I'm not saying this yes. is your uh, single initiative i'm sure there were many people <laughs> who contributed to to the setting up of gaps you've got very impressive uh advisory boards as well there's quite a, a few big names on there as well so what what was the main idea what was the main motivation for starting this oh and maybe we should clarify to the listener what gaps is as like a yes a de defining okay, let's it. do that first <laughs> let's yeah, let's do that first. So GABS is the acronym for the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists. And it's it's the world's first independent nonprofit association um, that sort of wants to connect or is there to connect the field of applied behavioral science. And that is establishing and safeguarding the legitimate interests of uh, bona fide behavioral science practitioners. And I think just by this, I've covered a lot of the motivations why we've set this up and why it's definitely a, a joint uh, team effort. Why so many people have joined this effort to set this up, being in both in practice and in academia. On the one hand, we felt that behavioral science and definitely applied behavioral science is at a stage where we need to somehow give a little bit of guidance on what constitutes a good applied behavioral science practice. Mm -hmm. um, that means technically it's not a protected name or profession. Anybody who's read Thinking Fast and Slow or Nudge can call themselves a um, behavioral scientist. Definitely an well, applied that is scientist. disappointing. That is very disappointing, especially those yes. two books. <laughs> yeah, as you see, that's already something. I think, I personally think um, they're good books, at least. Uh, judging on their impact they had on me and, and on the, the field in general. But I agree that there are, there might be some resources you, you like more. <laughs> um, I mean, for, for context, before I end up completely slagging off like two of the key features, or actually three, because one book of them has, has two authors, uh, three key features in behavioral science. I was uh, very late to this game. I read those books while I was at the end of my MSc in behavioral science. So... You know, right. different contexts. These are not the books that got me into the field. If these are the books that got you into the field, props to you. They, they definitely did. And I think still, even after having been longer in this field, I think they, both of them do, but let's not get down into that rabbit hole. Sure, both sure. of them still reveal a lot of insights, a lot of great things that you can use as a as a regular practitioner of the science. Um, but yeah, back to, back to GAPS. Um, it was founded on the principle of being in the first independent body. So it's not owned by any organization. It's mm -hmm. not owned by Effective. It's not owned by any other organization. It's really independent and they all represent equal shares, equal saying at the same table. At the same time, it's a combination and a bridge between academia and practice. So it is this idea of bringing practice and, behav and uh, in behavioral science and academia and the field of behavioral science together. And that's why we've created not only a board, an executive board, but also an advisory board uh, with some of the most renowned figures in this field, including Kahneman, Cialdini, Jennifer Lerner, Dilip Solman, Paul Dolan, and, uh, and many more. And really make sure that this, this, this connection is able uh, to be made and to flourish, <laughs> to use that word. And then lastly, I think with this connection and with this idea of creating a platform where people that who have a solid background in behavioral science, who've, who've done the training on a post-grad or a PhD level, who, who can become a member and show that they are sort of uh, eligible to, to join and to, to be a certified member of GAPS, they have also the ability to exchange with others and to, to make sure that this, this, this whole science, this whole 
is taken to a next level and, and is, is talked about more, is brought more into into the public interest and uh, helps us all to, to grow and make more use of the insights in practice. Fair enough. Yeah. Fantastic. That's that's sort of the motivation. So it's a lot of lot of different ideas and motivations. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So how how is it going? I mean, it's we're talking to you. I guess is it's not quite a year old. The official launch. Or... Yeah, the official launch has been September. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, so. Yeah, not quite a year, but you know, a lot, a lot has been happening this year. It feels like it's been five years since, since September. So, how is it going? Is it you know moving in the right direction? Is it are exciting things happening, or or things that we've yet to see that are? Yes, indeed, it does. So it goes back to um, early nineteen when we started the first discussions around creating gaps and launching it into the market. And it's taken quite some time to really work out all the details from the code of ethics to the way we want to operate to the yeah. articles and structures to sort of the go live ending with the branding, the website and everything we offer and host as, as, as a platform. So that was done in, in September uh, 2020. We launched and we've been overwhelmed by the interest from the field. So we had within... Four months, we had more than 700 pre-registrations on the website nice. for people who want to become a member. And we just launched this, hey, we're launching soon, register interest. And so 700 people said, oh, this is amazing. Something we waited for, um, registered their interest. And then, um, you know, this is the other story. It is a lot of work to then fully launch an association and to be able to welcome members uh, to be having a platform that allows a seamless application journey, including membership, registration, payment, onboarding, and a platform that is operate, uh, operating. And that was then done in late December. And so we're, I'd say, we've been, with the beginning of 2021, we are fully live and operational people who've registered and who've not yet registered and listened to this podcast should do, <laughs> go to <laughs> gaps.org and, and apply. And become a part of this vibrant community of already more than 120 fully registered practitioners and academics. We're seeing a lot of interest from even the most renowned figures in this field. And uh, we are now sort of with this great start moving into the next phase of organizing the first event series. There will be four major events this year. Mm -hmm. We'll have very exciting speakers lined up. Um, we have a kickoff event and a sort of a year end event. And without announcing too much already, there will be specific events in between on certain topics where we will again, engage practitioners and academics in a discussion around a specific application of behavioral science and practice. So a lot more to come. And then mid to long term, we will looking into to other, um, important elements such as even funding opportunities for future students, early access to academic and practitioner content and so on and so on, but that's still to be defined. And, and so a lot more work and stuff coming towards us in the next weeks and days. All sounds yeah. great. I, I have a specific question though. So, I mean, it makes yeah. sense to me that GAPS would be great for the practitioning side. Um, as a, as a community, as a network, as a way to propel yourself forward, as a way to, you know, show that you, do in fact do behavioral science properly. Mm -hmm. um, but you've got academics in there as well. So maybe maybe it's slightly uh, snobby of me to ask this, but what's the point for an academic? Well, I'd say first off, we're not credentializing behavioral scientists. So we are not in the game to say who is a certified behavioral scientist who isn't. That's definitely not what we're doing. There will but be- But you do have certificates, don't you? Yes, but I'm saying we're not we're not we're not going to be a gatekeeper, and we never never wanted to be, and we never will be. So the only thing we're saying is people who are certified members of GAPS possess the academic and um, applied qualifications to be calling themselves a behavioral scientist under the articles of GAPS. That's it. So people interested in commissioning services in behavioral science, for example, can go on the GAPS website and see who is a member and can therefore assess who's qualified to to offer behavioral science services. That's definitely one thing we do. And 
we're at the same time creating a platform to for exchange between academia and practice. So many of the academics who are members are looking for ways to, to get access to field data, are uh, looking for ways to engage with, I'd say, yeah, practitioner problems. Um, for example, employee motivation, um, ethics, risk, and compliance. Many of these things are researched in academia, but it's very difficult to sort of and then investigate them in a lab. And so you need to have real world data and access. And so there's something we're really happy to, to be uh, facilitating that exchange between academia and practice. So people that want to stay in academia, but want to have one foot in the practice and sort of one access to, um, into practice will find a good way to have that in gaps. All right, Definitely. that makes sense. So on, on the topic of academics, because I'm I'm just trying to figure out like the the inner workings and the underlying motivation. But your entire advisory board is academics. Why? Like that, there are rigorous practitioners, right? There are people in the in the practicing side of behavioral science which have made such a name for themselves through good application that I was quite surprised to, that you know the advisory board was predominantly academic. Well, the executive board um, are all people who are doing this full time in practice. So okay. there is, you, you shouldn't see the advisory board as an isolated board. There's always a constant exchange between the executive board and the advisory board. And so that exchange, you see the whole two boards together. We would hope it's a selection of some of the best practitioners and some of the best academics in this field. So this okay. conversation again is the two. And then again, on the advisory board, we also look at, look at, uh, yeah, a, a good mix of people that have, have done this in a way that has had impact on practice. So of course, the big names we talked about before come to mind, but also people like uh, Pelle Hansen or Maya Shanker, who's at mm -hmm. Google, like doing applied work in behavioral science. Mm -hmm. Adam Alter, um, who's doing a lot in, in sort of the area of marketing and communication, and who's working a lot in the intersection of practice and academia is also part of it, that advisory board. So it is a combination of the two and we are we are carefully looking to have both perspective from academia and from practice represented in, in the board's activities, yes. All right. I, I kind of think it's I think I, I think it's really cool, really, that Gabs is a place where people who are like, you know, think of themselves as academics and do work in order to get published in these sort of high impact journals and you know, within the setting of universities or wherever they are, can come and connect with people doing applied work. Because, I, I mean, I don't know of any other spaces that are doing this and sort of facilitating you know, a two-way conversation. I mean, would you say it's sort of like LinkedIn Plus for behavioral <laughs> scientists? Or is, that, or is that a cheapening? I don't mean to cheapen it, but... No, it, no. Oh, oh, well, that's, that's, that's cheapening it, but... It, LinkedIn is a very, very, very serious and very successful uh, company. Um, no, it's not because um, it's a nonprofit. <laughs> no, it's not because it's, um, it is, yeah, it is that platform and is that, that place to meet. But we're, of course, using LinkedIn and other media to sort of facilitate that exchange. And, and yeah, it is an association like some of the hopefully better other organizations that exist in this space and in the space of other uh, academic practices with a clear focus on application. Yeah. yeah. All right. So where is this going in the next five years? And mentally prepare yourself because I'm also going to ask this for effective. Oh my God. So I was just about to ask you, okay. So for gaps first, mm -hmm. I personally, and I'm hoping to match the expectations and the, the mission and vision of my, my many colleagues on the board. Um, I personally hope this, this platform is going to be representing a great science and a great set and resource for science, uh, academics in this science and practitioners of this science. So, I very much hope that this exchange that we talked about in the last 10 minutes is mm -hmm. taking place, is, is strengthened, and GAVS becomes a platform where people interested in behavioral science meet and then, yeah, take take their work to a more global level. The GE for global is really important. We really want to connect 
the different areas around the world and the different insights from around the world. I also hope that um, as a science as a whole, it gives it helps to establish behavioral science on an even bigger and broader level um, mm -hmm. that feels insights feed into other products, services, processes, policies, and strategies. So uh, this is also something for me. And I, I very personally, I hope that I have a lot more interesting conversations, a lot more great work, a lot more uh, like inspirational minds I meet and um, a lot more we can all benefit from collaborating together. On this. So that's my personal hope for the next five years. All right. A lot more conversation like this, actually, right now, which is really great. Oh, you're always <laughs> welcome back. Well, that was part one of the question. Next. <laughs> uh, effective. Oh, my God. Yep. Uh, rapid fire session. <laughs> the next five years, I'm, I'm going away from one glass bowl and I now look into the other glass bowl. Um, so for effective, I want to continue this, this idea of being a really specialized, dedicated behavioral science advisory firm. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure that we establish behavioral science in the policy making process and in the boardrooms mm -hmm. where strategies are made, policies are created and formulated. And I hope that we, as a team that has a, a lot of dimensions to get there, but as a team, I hope to further grow, as I said, into a set of behavioral science grounded yet diverse expertise. Mm -hmm. And um, I hope that we have, we continue to work and I will invest to do that actually, and not only hope, but really like a conviction to work as we do now in like public policy for about 50% and strategy and private organization for about 50%. And I want to continue doing what we do, what we've done in the past two years is to really raise the level of behavioral science from something you do mm -hmm. on top of things uh, towards a really, like this is the center of everything we do. We are applying a science-based, human-centered approach to our product design, to our policy design, to everything we do in the organization. I think we're, we're at the beginning of a revolution of really thinking in behavioral terms about the way we construct and design processes, policies, and, and strategies for, for everything. And I want to work personally well, hopefully, this is the five years plan. Um, embedding behavioral science automatically into the things we do in design. So that would be great. Something, mm -hmm. You know, I see a lot of, of, of people out there that, that are, and we sometimes do as well. Behavioral science is an exciting field. Everybody has been sitting in a presentation, keynote, webinar these days, mm -hmm. and be like, oh my God, this is such an exciting content. This is such an exciting field. Yes, I see why this happens. I, I catch myself falling for biases and then even having someone explaining to me why this happens is, is sort of a eureka moment, amazing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of behavioral science sells on this fascination, which is great. But I think we now, mid to long term, need to get into translating this into the way we think about strategies and processes. So we need to now make sure that when we know about groupthink and we know how behavioral science can inform better group decision making, we need to then give people opportunities being it physical or digital solutions or simply processes uh, in organizations that these biases are not created or sort of are not fallen for. And mm -hmm. we need to design elements and sort of using what we know from behavioral science and not just sell on this fascination but really use these insights, use experiments, help people make sense of what actually happens in practice and then design for that. Pretty straightforward. Interesting. I never heard, never heard of it in that way of selling fascination. I mean, it's, it's kind of the way that, I mean, that's how, that's how I got interested, but it's how to translate it from the fascination. Yeah, yeah me too. Okay. It's, I got, yeah. I, I'm still, I'm still, because I'm fascinated every day. I'm fascinated. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. um, it is, it is exciting, but in the end, it is, we need to get beyond keynotes. And this is something I'm proud of. We got beyond, in many projects, we got beyond keynotes and 
excitement. We do that. And I love to be teaching behavioral science. I love to be speaking about insights from the field of behavioral science and how they translate into practice, something I really enjoy. But to make a real impact, to make sure that we have a sustainable place in the strategic process, we need to make sure that we go beyond that and really use our insights to to embed it at the core of the process and not just at the end of making things a little nicer and more exciting. Fantastic. Well, that doesn't sound like an easy job, so I don't envy you. Um, <laughs> good, <laughs> good luck. Uh, we will be keeping a close eye on uh, you and your progress uh, for sure. And if for the listener who also would like to keep a close eye on on you and uh, you know the consultancy, effective advisory, and Gabs, could you point them into a direction? Where can they go after they listen to this episode? Yeah, of course. So best is first starting point probably is the is the website which is effective hyphen advisory.com don't forget the hyphen yeah a f f e c t i v e uh because only if you design for effective reactions you can get some sort of effective solutions that's a bit of a game twist we're playing it's the nice. <laughs> the name explained nice. very much <laughs> the name very explained meta. yeah um and of course you can find us on linkedin and uh on yeah where else? I think LinkedIn. And that's it. I guess for Gabs, it's gaabs.org. Also, Gabs has a, a nicely growing uh, community on LinkedIn where everybody's happy to join and, and, and sort of follow the developments. That's you, you GAABS. You seem to be a fan of LinkedIn. Um, I think I'm, I'm very restricted in my social media use linkedin is the only platform i'm using okay and so not, not not on tiktok yet not yet no no dances on tiktok yet maybe okay. we should uh, do the see, behavioral science dance on tiktok one you're day missing I'm, out. you're missing I'm out missing that's out. another no, way you could, no. you could fascinate people with behavioral yeah. science on tiktok yeah. <laughs> i wonder i think that 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 would require another episode sort of to sketch out dance move <laughs> um we can um but that's probably offline. And then there is, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's that's probably where you can find us best. And of course, I'm also happy to sort of reply to any emails that you that I get and people who are interested in in, in working or just sharing some ideas and, and insights together. Please reach out. We can promise that Torben is actually pretty decent over email. He's not like most <laughs> academics where you just it just disappears into the void. <laughs> I think that was almost a compliment, <laughs> Torben. Almost. From almost, almost. Yeah. Thank you so much, Yala. I, I appreciate wow. it. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, you're Thank very you welcome. so much. You're very, very <laughs> welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Torben, for, for giving up a part of your morning and second breakfast to come yeah. and speak with us today. We really appreciate it, honestly. Um, it's going to be a great episode. Yeah, thank you so much for this interview. I um, enjoyed it myself. It was great. Thanks very much. And uh, looking forward to following your podcast and, and the work you're doing. And seeing you in academia, Mele, and seeing you in, in practice, Sarah, or both. Yeah, let's see. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. see. We'll see. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was us talking to Torben. Uh, as always, Torben, thank you so much for making the time. We had a great chat. So Sarah, what did you think? Are you now motivated to start your own behavioral science-based consultancy? I mean, it sounds like such hard work. I'm not going to lie. Um, but it's been really interesting to get a bit more of an insight into what it takes, what you sort of, uh, the dimensions that you need to sort of think through. Um, you know, it's, really trying to merge you know this uh the the novelty and excitement that comes with learning about behavioral science for the first time and applying behavioral science um it's it's something that anyone can get excited about but also trying to figure out a, a way that you can make it profitable and sustainable mm -hmm. um and you know I, this podcast is all about learning new things both of us are you know <laughs> almost like fresh out of the nest of the, <laughs> of the academic nest. And so we're going to have to be trying to think about how are we going to make a living uh, moving forward in the next couple of years. And yeah, I mean, it, it's just been fascinating to, to pick Torbin's brain um, and, and, you know, to, to see that uh, he had the guts 
to do this, to leave uh, leave his um, leave his job and and take a bit of a risk. But I think it's I think it's paid off for him. Fair so far. Play. <laughs> I think effective advisor is quite well known. The the team is growing, so I would argue it has paid off. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I would have the balls yet to set up my own company, but you know, we'll see, we'll see. Um, mm. What did you think about GABS? Did you know about GABS, the Global Association of Applied Behavioral Scientists, for those who have forgotten? Um, what, what do you think of it? Would you join it? Is it for you? Interesting. Uh, yes, I had heard of GABS sort of um, through the Twitter sphere mm -hmm. uh, about conversations going on, teasing that it was going to be uh, coming soon. And yeah, I mean, I, I think that... Uh, I would have no qualms about about joining. Um, I guess right now, uh, the, I mean, yeah, I don't really know what's stopping me from just just applying. I guess I've a bit of imposter syndrome of of being like, what the hell am I going to put on the firm? I don't really have an experience of being a an applied behavioral scientist. I would pr probably have to at the moment be coming into GABS as a uh, researcher or, or an, an academic. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, it was interesting to speak to Torbin about, you know, who like who is Gabs a place for? Because mm -hmm. um, really, yeah, that uh, it was, yeah. Uh, so, so yes, potentially, okay. very, very much potentially, I would. What I mean, what about yourself? Where where do you fall on the the Gabs joining decision? <laughs> I think I might have initially misunderstood as to what GABS was supposed to be doing. So mm. with I, uh, as active as I am on LinkedIn, which is starting to become a social media obsession, which I probably, it's a habit I need to kick. Um, I saw quite a lot of people posting their GABS certificate. So I thought that part of GABS was a gatekeeping slash accreditation program. But according right. to Torben, that is not at all what it is. So either the marketing went wrong or I just drew the wrong conclusions. Both are equally likely. Um, but yeah, so I, I initially thought this was like a, a, a gatekeeping, a, a signal that if you were in GABS as a practitioner, uh, because the academic standards are just very, very different, that, you know, the, the behavioral science that you did was sound rigorous, that the knowledge you had of behavioral science is well-trained, um, right. stuff like that. But I, I think I've just completely understood because I have no idea this was supposed to be a knowledge-sharing platform. I thought right. this was mainly a, uh, a, a part of Signal, uh, like, you know, a, a group that this is good behavioral science practice. Um so yeah, I mean, it was a learning experience for me. Do I think I will join GABS? Well, if it's a knowledge sharing platform where, you know, some academics like, well, still me currently, uh, can find data and collaborations with practitioners, I don't see why not. Um, but if it is still mainly the, the value signaling thing, well, I, I hope that my PhD will do the value signaling for me. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah it's, it's yeah. just, it, it kind of depends what you want out of GABS, I suppose. I mean, I do support the initiative, definitely. Mm. Yeah, it's been interesting because we have had conversations um, with other people on the podcast who, you know, ethical conversations about the application of behavioral mm. science and sort of saying that really anyone could call themselves a behavioral scientist. Yeah. You know, anyone who's, you know, read a couple of, of books uh, likes the idea, you know, Right, you can't can't fault people for liking the idea behind behavioral science, but then to actually apply it in an ethical and rigorous way does mm -hmm. take a lot of experience and training. And that's obviously you can get that training and that experience without having to do a whole PhD. Thank God, because imagine if everyone mm -hmm. had to get a PhD, ridiculous. I mean, talk about gatekeeping. Mm -hmm. um, but people, you know, there, there's been the sort of thread through our conversations about, um, you know there being some sort of need uh, to to be able to signal that you are a, an applied behavioral scientist with, you know, uh, years of experience and, and knowledge and, a, you know, a, a CV of being able to apply uh, ethically behavioral science and, and practically and effectively yeah. behavioral science. But yeah, I mean, it sounds like Gabs is doing a lot more like in in that in that regard than what i thought as well like you know the, this talk of um 
potentially scholarship programs in the future and mm. and meetups and events and conferences and, and networking opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, who knows? I think that what Gabs is, is going to be changing. Oh, definitely. As as it sort of finds its its footing. Um but yeah, yeah, exciting to exciting to see it right from the beginning and see Absolutely. Where it's going. I just hope they can keep the hype going beyond the hype from the very beginning. Because that I'm is sure. because that tends to be the most difficult thing <laughs> from what I've noticed from associations uh, starting up. But yeah, we'll we'll keep an eye on Gabs. We'll keep you posted, hopefully. Um I'm pretty sure we'll do many more interviews with people who are through either academic or practitioning capacity affiliated with Gabs, so we can always ask them those questions. Uh but yeah, I think this is it for today's episode. Uh we unfortunately could not deliver you the ready steady cook guidelines for starting up your own business in behavioral science, which Trust me, dear listener, hurts me more than it hurts you. <laughs> I was really looking <laughs> forward towards a, a step-by-step program of how to start your own business. Would have made my life a lot easier. But as always, we hope you thought this episode was educational, thought-provoking, or at least entertaining. And we hope you have a good week. And we hope to see you again next week. Bye. You're the dummy that don't believe in science All your projects always be denying You're the one I love You're the one I wanna give to